Hi, I'm Jose Hogler from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. I'm glad to welcome here Dr. Gregory Marcos, Professor of Medicine at UC uh, San Francisco. He's the primary author of the study uh, I Stop AF trial, which was presented today at late breaking uh, sessions. Uh, this is a very unique, unusual design, but innovative design as well. Uh, Dr. Marcos, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, tell us a little bit of uh, this uh, unique trial, the format, the N of one format, and what are the issues that you're trying to address? What is the clinical question? Yeah. So if we you know, think about the great majority of conventional randomized trials, Ultimately, they can only give us information regarding differences in average uh, or averages between fairly large groups and may not necessarily reflect what's most pertinent to each and every individual. And ultimately, of course, our patients, our loved ones want to know what should they themselves do. So there's this notion of uh, conducting systematic N of one trials that are ideally randomized to uh, mitigate against confounding. And unfortunately, we can't apply an N of one strategy to everything. To do so successfully re requires a few uh, criteria. So the phenomenon of interest or the outcome of interest needs to be repeatable. It can't be catastrophic. If the outcome is death, you can't test on and off, for example. Similarly, the exposures need to be something that's repeatable uh, and also ideally something that's readily available. So for example, you it's, we can't test necessarily in a randomized way when it's raining or it's not raining. Atrial fibrillation patients have long told us both clinically and we also did this in a fairly formalized way that their triggers for their distinct or individual atrial fibrillation episodes are of great interest to them. And especially among those with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where these triggers are exposures or behaviors that are under the direct control of uh, our patients, uh, that would, uh, we, we thought, would be especially amenable uh, to this N of one uh, strategy. So the ISTOP AFib study was actually designed in collaboration with atrial fibrillation patients to try to get at several uh, issues regarding triggers. So we recruited participants from our Healthy Heart Study, a worldwide internet-based uh, study. Uh, we collaborated with the CEO of StopAFib.org, this uh, very large uh, internet-based uh, organization. Uh, Melanie True Hills uh, is an AFib patient, the CEO, CEO, and she's a co-author. We worked with Debbie McCall, who has a large uh, kind of Twitter uh, following interested in atrial fibrillation, also herself an AFib patient, and several other patients to designed this study and to help recruit for it completely remotely. We then brought patients in via uh, the Eureka Digital Research Platform. This is a uh, mobile health-based infrastructure that's NIH funded that we've created at UCSF to facilitate mobile health quite broadly. We sent uh, all uh, consenting participants that met our eligibility criteria, a live core cardiomobile devices and, and integrated those with the study this is a handheld device that enables recording of a single lead ECG and has uh, FDA um, uh, approved uh, algorithm to detect AFib. And then participants were randomly assigned to just track their atrial fibrillation for several weeks versus to undergo their own personalized N of one trials where they were presented with a menu of potential triggers, including alcohol, caffeine, lack of sleep, certain exercises. They could also uh, write in uh, customized triggers of interest, and they were then randomized a week on, week off, uh, again, in a random order to either go ahead and test your trigger this week. You told us, for example, that two glasses of red wine tends to trigger your AFib, or in the avoid weeks, they were instructed, make sure you avoid alcohol this week, if alcohol was their trigger of interest. And then at the end, at 10 weeks, uh, we assessed their quality of life using a validated questionnaire called the AFEQT that, um, that kind of uh, summarizes their AFib severity, uh, AFib-related quality of life over those past 10 weeks. At the end, 
uh, understanding that the people who enrolled and were randomly assigned to AFib tracking alone may have been very disappointed to be enrolled in that arm. We then provided them the opportunity to continue to test their triggers. And similarly, those initially randomized to test one trigger were uh, told, thanks for your participation. You can end now if you'd like, but if you want to test another trigger, you know, let us know. And then they could uh, select another trigger for subsequent testing. Importantly, after their, those randomly assigned to N of one trigger testing or subsequently deciding to do so, were presented with their own results. So we communicated back to them, here's the probability that based on the information you've given us, and we asked them every day, did you have AFib today, yes or no? And we asked them to send a, a, a live core re recording every day. We gave them the prob probability that their presumed trigger did indeed influence their AFib. And we showed them an illustration with a calendar that demonstrated, here's where you were assigned to test your trigger. Here's where you were assigned to avoid your trigger. And here's where you told us uh, you had AFib. And ultimately we were testing the hypothesis that undergoing those NF1 trials being informed by such randomized trials might improve uh, quality of life uh, related to AFib. Yeah, so so summarize the patients were uh, uh, identifying their triggers and you guys correlating their triggers and their perception of the triggers with actual rhythm uh, strips from the Alive Core device. Very unique, very uh, innovative design. I like that a lot. And tell me, what were the findings? Uh, yes. What did I find? So in terms of the uh, results, um, our primary outcome was this change in the AFEQT, uh, this validated questionnaire. And actually, we did not uh, observe any differences there between the groups randomized to N of 1 trigger testing versus not. However, when we looked at the real-time reporting of AFib events in the four weeks following N of 1 testing versus not, the individuals randomly assigned to N of 1 testing actually did exhibit substantially less AFib episodes, suggesting that perhaps there was some benefit to undergoing the N of 1 testing. And when we looked at, well, what were the triggers that those people tested that seemed to uh, subsequently experience less AFib? It was the people testing alcohol, dehydration, uh, and exercise. Then in terms of the actual N of 1 results, so meaning what triggers really were associated with AFib in the near term? It was really only alcohol that came out in multiple analyses. And, and this slide demonstrates one of several that was associated in per protocol, importantly, with self-reported AFib. So using the Alive Core device, we actually could not find any evidence of a, a clear relationship between a given trigger exposure and AFib. And in intention to treat, Similarly, we found no statistically significant relationships, but in per protocol, meaning we asked them every day, did you actually expose yourself to your trigger or not? When they exposed themselves to alcohol, they did have more AFib. Also of interest, caffeine uh, was the most commonly selected trigger to test, but that did not exhibit any relationships. And in fact, if you look at that relative risk, it's a little bit, uh, or the odds ratio, a little bit to the left, almost uh, suggesting it's protective. And one analysis I showed here, those who selected customized triggers, so they just wrote in something very specific. They also uh, seem to have more AFib when exposed uh, to that trigger. Dr. Marcos, can you tell us a little bit what were those customized descriptions? What did the patients uh, wrote yeah, down? They were primarily diff uh, very specific types of food uh, mm -hmm. or specific activity, specific exercises, mm -hmm. for example. I see. Uh, caffeine is a superfood then. I drink every day my cup of coffee. That's good news. <laughs> that's um, right, that's right. Clinical correlation. What do we do with this information? What can we tell our patients? Yes. So uh, to try to summarize all these results, we, you know, we can't, we, we did not find that randomized assignment to trigger testing resulted in overall quality of life. And yet uh, we found that uh, the N of 1 testing was associated with less AFib episodes. So these are kind of uh, apparently discordant uh, results. One way, you know, one explanation uh, for the inconsistency may be that the validated questionnaire at the end is more prone to recall bias, whereas checking with them every day and looking at AFib as it happens 
uh, may be more accurate. On the other hand, the AFEQT does capture more than simply, did you have AFib or not? Uh, more, so it's more broadly pertinent to severity uh, more broadly. I think, in, and then in terms of the individual triggers, you know, caffeine, despite being the most commonly selected trigger for testing, uh, was not associated with AFib. And this fits quite well with other observational da data, growing evidence that caffeine may really not be important. Uh, when it comes to increasing AFib risk, and there is in fact some some evidence it may be protective, whereas alcohol, also consistent with the literature, uh, more and more uh, has demonstrated very consistent evidence of a near-term harmful effect regarding increasing uh, AFib episode risk. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Marcus. I guess we can tell our patients to avoid alcohol. We knew that. Any new information we can learn from this? Well, I think, I hope that this opens the door to these sorts of N of one studies. I think that there are many lessons learned just from this sort of approach that's quite individualized that modern technologies now enable, you know, in the absence of smartphones and wearable devices, for example, this just wouldn't have been possible. But being able to send uh, individuals, you know, mobile app based push notifications or texts in a, in a timed way to send them reminders enables this sort of study that I hope will help empower patients and uh, make us all think more about this sort of N of one personalized sorts of uh, approaches. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Marcos. Thank you for being with us today. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.